welcome to the Architectural Association this evening. We have an uh, uh, interesting discussion with a very simple question uh, that uh, we are going to uh, try to unfold. Uh, my name is John Palmesino, and uh, I am uh, running here uh, Diploma 4. And uh, this is uh, an event that is linked to uh, the open uh, seminar series called Plant the Planet. And uh, we are investigating in the uh, series uh, how architecture intercepts and sometimes diverges from preoccupations of planetary uh, change. And uh, in particular, we have been following the uh, very awkward uh, work of uh, this uh, ambiguous figure uh, at the center of every single turn of uh, modern architecture, uh, Jacqueline Turret, that was present in every single important moment uh, in uh, the making of uh, what we celebrate uh, as the heroic moment of modern architecture, starting with uh, the making of the International Congresses of Modern Architecture in, in the 50s, where uh, Jacqueline Turret was uh, the backseat organizer for uh, Siegfried Gideon and uh, CERT, uh, all the way to uh, organizing uh, the work of uh, Doxiadis, uh, uh, of Buckminster Fuller, the famous Dela Symposia that brought together uh, the uh, major anthropologists and uh, scientists uh, of uh, the 60s and 70s, all the way to the establishment of uh, the United Nations Habitat uh, Program, uh, with very complex discussion about the role of uh, human construction and the ambiguous word habitat. Uh, this evening, uh, it's a real pleasure uh, to have uh, at the table uh, Professor Davor Vidas and Professor uh, Alan Pottage. Uh, uh, Davor is a, a research professor at the Fritjof Nansen Institute, uh, which is one of the most incredible organizations uh, in uh, contemporary life because it combines the ethos of Fritjof Nansen, the Arctic explorer, uh, looking at uh, geography with uh, his other uh, main preoccupation, uh, peace. Uh, in particular, the entire work uh, of the Fritjof Nansen Institute, which is a research institute mainly on law, international law, and policy making, really combines the uh, initial ethos of Fritjof Nansen of exploring uh, in that moment, the Arctic, of course, and uh, his preoccupation with refugees, the famous uh, um, Nansen passports. Professor uh, Vides uh, is uh, the director of the Law of the Sea program at the Fritjof Nansen Institute. Uh, Davor is, uh, you will see, in the most striking, uh, sharp mind in thinking how to rewrite the international law of the sea, and for many reasons uh, they, that are linked to this very simple question that we're going to unfold this evening. He is uh, a working uh, group uh, member. That means uh, the Anthropocene Working Group has also a lawyer, an international lawyer among uh, their accolades, and that is uh, Davor Vidas. And I remember very well in the meeting that uh, was organized uh, uh, for the Anthropocene Working Group at the House of World Cultures in 2014, when you actually managed to bring all of you together. Only one person stood on the other side of the table, and that was Davor uh, taking uh, a very important uh, position in that. Um, Davor is... Uh, a prolific author, more than 10 books? Are there 10? Yeah. No, 11. 11. <laughs> and each one, of which, each one of which is the opposite of a little pamphlet. It's a very uh, interesting uh, intellectual condition. Uh, and Davor Vidas uh, is uh, a major uh, figure uh, in uh, thinking the Anthropocene. And uh, he will uh, discuss this evening uh, how he came about it and how uh, his presence in the working group uh, can be. He also serves as the editor-in-chief of the journal uh, monograph series, uh, Brill Research Perspective uh, on the Law of the Sea. And uh, the, uh, he's uh, also of uh, authors of popularizing uh, books on the Anthropocene. So he combines high scholarship with uh, a more popular approach. 
Alan Pottage uh, from the London School of Economics is a professor of law, and uh, before joining the law department at the LSC, you were a researcher uh, at the Law Commission and uh, a lecturer in School of Law at King's College. Uh, the work of uh, Alain is the most remarkable uh, for the discussion this evening in the sense that you combine uh, an insight from law with uh, uh, what we might consider our domain, that is uh, an understanding of uh, media and mediation. And uh, we'll have an amazing uh, insight in your work. One of the uh, incredible elements uh, in the scholarship of Alain is really how he always manages to bring together uh, minds from all uh, kinds of uh, studies, uh, always bringing together different lines in order to re uh, make uh, new compounds. I, uh, I like to think of your work as uh, creating compounds uh, that give a new insight. The work of uh, uh, Alain is also linked to that of uh, colleagues like uh, Mario uh, Biagioli, who is a, a critical uh, study historian, and uh, he's been uh, working a lot uh, in collaboration with uh, other scholars. And tonight, uh, I think that we will have an amazing insight coming from one of your most recent uh, publications on uh, jurisprudence and the Holocene. So you start understanding that the question that we're going to address tonight is whether law is from the Holocene. The evening is going to be structured in uh, very simple terms in two parts. We'll start with presentations from uh, our guests and then we'll move on to uh, the larger uh, debate and discussion. But pr before we uh, get on with the presentation, please join me in uh, welcoming uh, Davron Alain to the Architectural Association. Welcome. <laughs> Davor, please. Thank you, John, very much. Um, as I was listening, I was thinking, whom is he talking about? I was getting embarrassed <laughs> and indeed of being obliged. And I only have a few very simple ideas to share with you. Some notes which I, I put down, notes down because I otherwise forget. So, and then it's important to put them down in 15 minutes, isn't it? 15 minutes is important. 15 minutes. But I must say, first and foremost, I am very happy to be here. I'm very grateful for your and Anne Sophie's invitation to come to an architectural association, which I never spoke in any architectural school before. Um, I'm a lawyer, as you know. But the question which you sent, the, the title which you sent, is Law from the Holocene. Well, that one indeed immediately resonates, and for me, it also immediately revoked some memories. And it brought me back 10 years ago. Uh, it was August 2009, and I know the date. It was 28th August 2009. And on that date, I had one strange word written in my notebook. And I didn't know its meaning, really. It stood there for about a year. Um, I remember when I wrote it down, that was one conference which our institute, Friedrich Nansen Institute in Norway, convened in order to mark our 50th anniversary. And the conference was about law and policy for the oceans. The title of the conference was The World Ocean in Globalization. Um, at about that time, the United Nations Convention of the Law of the Sea, which we international lawyers often refer to as Constitution of the Oceans. It was about a quarter of a century old. It was adopted at the end of 1982. Uh, it then entered into force in 94. So it was the time to assess it. And we thought it was very appropriate for our institute to, in a way, link our 50th anniversary to the 25th anniversary of the convention. Uh, the reason why it was not really on time is that we didn't get funding for the conference the year before, but I, this was just a footnote. Um, but what we wanted really to do was we wanted to critically assess 
the functioning of our constitution, UNCLOS, as we call it. This is the acronym, United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. We call it UNCLOS. We call it wrongly. Conference, the third conference really is UNCLOS. But um, in the program of the conference, we decided to formulate one hypothesis. And the hypothesis was that changes regarding the oceans in the post-World War period in general, and perhaps even only since the negotiation of UNCLOS in the course of the 1970s, were bigger than all changes in the preceding history. Of course, human law of the sea history, less than all of the history, but ocean's law, if you could say, or sea law. And then we invited some 200 participants from world round in order to discuss this. And in addition to lawyers and political scientists, which whom we usually invite, we now indeed invited also some marine scientists. And one scientist, he was from New Zealand, in his speech mentioned that A word. And I noted it down. Um, I never heard of it before. So that was the reason why I wrote it down, uh, simply in order not to forget it. And then as I drafted the program for the conference, including its hypothesis, I also had to edit the proceedings. And that was a challenge. It was 66 contributors, um, two volumes, 1,200 pages, and I don't need to tell you about how the index work looked. And I did it old-fashioned way, checking page by page. Um, so editing took quite some time in this very old way fashion. And a year after the conference, I came to the chapter by the New Zealand uh, scientist. And well, that was that late August day of 2009, 28 August. And when I typed that strange word on my PC, the Microsoft Word Office program underlined it with red, this red color, indicated this was an error. Well, but it was written letter by letter as in the manuscript I received from the author. So I spelled it, I looked at it, A-N-T-H-R-O-P-O-C-N-E, and so, Anthropocene. I took from the shelf my um, Oxford Advanced Dictionary of English, I'm not a native speaker, as you have already noticed. Um, to check it, the word was not mentioned there. Now, neither it was found in a rather more comprehensive um, Merriam-Webster reference dictionary. It was found nowhere. I checked various sources, so I did what was most re reasonable to do. Probably I would start, uh, that was 10 years ago, of course. Now I would start from this, I googled the word. And on that summer day in 2009, that's only 10 years ago, there were altogether 64 hits on Google for the word Anthropocene. Some of those were also double hits. So in fact, there were around 50 entries on the entire Google. Um, worldwide, or worldwide, wide, web-wide, if you wish. A trade today is over 50, 5 million. Uh, but on that summer day, I was able to print all of the 50 discoveries. Um, and more than that, I was also able to read them all in a single day. You know, Scandinavian days, especially Norwegian days, in some <laughs> are very long, opposite to what they are now. Um, but the texts were short, a few pages each. So it was not difficult to read all 50. Um, you know, the article by um, Krutzen and, and Stoimer of 2000, two, three pages, two pages, I think. Then you have Krutzen's 2002 in Nature, uh, Jan Zalashevich and 21 other author of the Stratigraphic Commission of London in 2008. But they were almost the longest on Wet4. But there was one longer article, a very good, very interesting article by Will Steffen, um, Paul Krutzen, and John McNeil from Ambio. Uh, 
in 2007. That was maybe coming all the way to eight pages. Well, I think that until that summer day, I was, one might say, a kind of a normal international lawyer. An international lawyer of, of a rather traditional school of international law. In, in my earlier teaching at the University of Zagreb, we used a manual by a late professor who established the chair in 1927. He wrote that classic treatise on international law in 1948. It passed various subjects, various editions, and I think that when I was teaching, it was the eighth edition. The structure was the same as the, as the one from 1948, and I think that they used the same one with updates still to <laughs> with unchanged structure, really. But after that summer day of 2009, my view on international law, which has been quite formed after working for around 25 years in the field until that time, has started to undergo a change. And I think this change has been going on since that time. Uh, so this is also why I'm with you in the Architecture Association and not in Grace Inn uh, close, close by. Um, so first, I must explain why has my view of international law, of my discipline, has been changed. Uh, you see, per any standard definition of international law, this branch of law is a legal system which regulates relations between states and other subjects of international law, other international law subjects, recognized in international community. It regulates how boundaries are... I did some harm again. It regulates how boundaries um, are determined between different states, how states emerge, and how their statehood becomes recognized, how maritime areas are divided, where does the sovereignty end. Also, um, when we de determine how, how far the sovereign rights go, then we also have to regulate rights on the high seas. Uh, so we are speaking about high seas freedoms. Uh, we are speaking about enabling global navigation and so on and so forth. International law determines, or it has the objective of regulating, many things of international life in, win in which one thing is eternal, and that is political change. A key objective of international law is to aspire at stability in international relations. Those relations are, of course, prone to a constant political change. And this type of change is inbuilt in the system. However, that system, the system of international law, does not have one other type of change inbuilt. Quite the contrary, it implicitly assumes that there is relative stability in that other respect. That is, of course, the background of natural conditions, of earth system conditions. Those are, with only some exceptions, like the change of flow of rivers, the changes in deltas, those which are based on experience. Perceived in international law as being more or less permanent. So earth system conditions, relative stability. They always were such from generation to generation. And this type of stability is our experience all since the dawn of written history. In all the changes of empires and civilizations, that a relative stability has been with us for several millennia. And that is the stability of the late Holocene. International law takes 
the Holocene for granted. As a lawyer, you never think about the Holocene. You are in the Holocene. That is your framework. Those are your tacitly accepted boundaries. And then suddenly comes a different horizon that we might no longer be in the Holocene. Uh, which means in the familiar circumstances of relative stability. And that we are entering into something else, something different. And that is the Anthropocene. A new period of geological time, which is increasingly marked by change, unpredictability, and likely quite unstable conditions. Upon realizing this horizon, you have to ask yourself a question such as our seminar organizers, John and Anne Sophie, put so aptly here is law from the Holocene? Or limited to my legal discipline, is international law from the Holocene? Uh, the moment you ask that question as an international lawyer, you must think about was this, what this house is for, architecture. Since the question has to do with architecture. Um, so now, let me show you one illustration of why this has so profound implications for, for international law. The, the picture here will show, well, this one will not show much, this one will. Um, now, first, let's look at, at the situation as it is. We have sea level, relatively stable. We have continents which, are, which stretch under the sea. So there is a landmass, there is a continental shelf. And this is the situation in reality. But then come, lawyers come in the picture. And then they build one architecture, one structure. First, what we do is we put a territorial sea baseline at the low water mark. Um, from the baseline, all towards the, the land is internal waters, bays, uh, well, smaller segments of water, and all outside, 12 nautical miles stretching not only to the sea, but also in the air and uh, submarine areas, is the territorial sea under the full sovereignty of a coastal state. We are not satisfied with that. We go further. Then we have one jurisdictional zone, which is called contiguous zone. There are additional 12 nautical miles. Then we want more. We want to have sovereign rights over fishing, but we don't think this is sufficient. So we, we stretch this also under the uh, under the sea, to the seabed and submarine areas, because this covers oil as well and minerals. So there are sovereign rights here. This is not part of the state territory, but there are sovereign rights which are exclusive for the coastal state, for fishing and for oil and, and for mineral exploitation. We like to secure this more, so we put continental shelf, which is not applying to the, to the sea, sea column, uh, the water column, but to the submarine areas. Again, it goes uh, 200 nautical miles uh, in any condition. And then beyond that, it can, we have extended continental shelf. Uh, how far it goes, that is the longest definition in, in the Law of the Sea Convention. Uh, I will not read it. It has more than a page. So we would spend almost the entire rest of my 15 minutes. Um, but it goes about approximately 350 nautical miles from the baseline with many nuances of what we do. Then beyond that, we have high seas, sea free for all, navigation, uh, marine scientific research, fishing, and so on. And then down at the sea submarine area, we have the area, international seabed area, uh, the area where, um, which is proclaimed the common heritage of mankind. There is no oil there, but there are certain minerals. Now, um, 
the cornerstone of this architecture, and it is architecture, I think, is, and it serves an important pur purpose, it serves for the division of maritime zones of approximately 150 coastal states, but it also determines rights on the seas of the rest of about 50 landlocked states. The, the cornerstone is this baseline, a line of coastal stability, the line relying on coastal stability. If that stability collapses, the system may literally fall into water. And it took 400 years to build it, at least, if you take Hugo Grossius, Mare Liberum, as a starting reference point. We could go further in history, but for simplicity reasons, this is perhaps the best starting point. So what we have to do regarding this, but also many other aspects of in today's international law, such as criteria for statehood of some island countries, human rights and migrations, interpretation of international treaties in those circumstances, and so on. What we have to do is to look ahead and try to adjust the system to this change characteristic of the Anthropocene, of the Anthropocene in order to prevent the system from collapsing. How do you say we need a plan, plan the planet? Yes, we do need a very serious plan, and it's not easy. Uh, since if international law collapses, or when international law collapses, as it has happened in history before, then it is ultima ratio. Then in other words, we have little, if any, mechanisms for the avoidance of international conflicts, and little to assist us in maintaining international peace. Uh, this core objective of international law must remain unchanged. While many other aspects of international law, we will have to change and we will have to adjust. As the changing conditions we require or the Anthropocene we require. This perspective of looking on international law, in which one makes a distinction between the rules that emerged under implicit assumption of the Holocene conditions of stability, and that that's basically almost all of the fundamental rules of international law, if you speak about obje objects of international law, and even subjects of international law. Um, on the one hand, and their application and adjustment to quite different conditions of the Anthropocene, marked by change, um, marked by less predictability, and marked by far more uncertainty. That is a new way of looking at international law. But in my view, it is a, a, a rather, rather urgently needed perspective. Think of sea level rise. Think of changes which, are, which do have quite serious consequences that are unavoidable in decades to come. So let me illustrate this, what I've said so far, in a very short um, well, physical illustration, if you wish, with the help of two books which I brought with me. You know, those two books, of all the books published in the Law of the Sea, um, those two are the bottom line. So, when you wish to clean your library and your shelves, when you are law of the sea lawyer, then you keep those two. Um, and then also it's quite good with those recent uh, limitations on hand luggage. I, I passed elegantly, no problem at all. Nor the Norwegian Airlines have introduced the weighting of our hand luggage, no problem, kilo and a half. Um, half kilo was, or maybe under half, is the first book. And that first one was published in 1609. <laughs> it is Mare Liberum by Hugo Grossius. It's a lot of commentary in here, but Mare Liberum is only 66 pages in a rather generous font. Um, 
And as I mentioned, we can take it as a foundation of the law of the sea as a discipline. The second book is far bigger. It contains what was adopted in 1982, UNCLOS, as I mentioned, United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, the Constitution of the Oceans, the legal framework for all its uses and limits. In between those two books, I should put it up here, there are 373 years. In political thinking, this is an immense amount of time. It's almost four centuries. There are so much about. Think what has happened from 1609 to 1982. But when we think about the Anthropocene and the Holocene relations, the two books come together. They are both written for the Holocene, implicitly. It was an assumption which was implied. Um, and we have no third book as yet. There is no law of the sea for the Anthropocene. So before concluding, and with apologies if I exceeded maybe 15 minutes or I am about uh, 15 minutes, just a few, three notes. Um, what is the Anthropocene? We must start any discussion from that. Um, and I trust that we might start by offering at least three aspects of what it is. First of all, the Anthropocene is simply a word. A word, until recently, not found in dictionaries and considered to be an error in spelling check. <laughs> Second, and beyond words, the Anthropocene refers to our present day reality. It is the current status of the Earth system in all its complex interactions. And those interactions include us, humans. That is something in need of being studied and also formally acknowledged through due scientific process. And this is what the Anthropocene Working Group is working on. <coughs> And there is also a third aspect of what the Anthropocene is. It is quite possibly one of the biggest challenges for our future as a species, not only as people grouped in a nations or states. In that aspect, in that last third aspect, as long as we have interstate relations, we will have international law. We will need international law for quite some time in future. But what we will need is international law suited for the Anthropocene. Because with the Earth in the Anthropocene, we will no longer be able to keep the world, meaning the political world, in the Holocene. And I guess I should at this point really complete my introduction. Thank you for being so tolerant, moderator, and chair. And thank you very much for, to all for your very kind attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dar. I think that further down, we will have to discuss what an horizon is for a lawyer. Um, Alain. Up to you. Uh, well, first of all, thank you enormously to you and Sophie for the invitation, to you guys for being here. Um, uh, and I look forward to the conversation that will follow. Um, I think the brief is to be brief um, and simply to perhaps uh, um, offer some grist to the mill of the conversation that will follow. Um, and with that in mind, I have about three or four observations to make, which um, will be succinct. Um, 
So, John, you began with the sort of discreet provocation of saying that this was a simple question. Um, and then you repeated it and said it was a very simple question. Um, and I'm not sure about that. Um, and my observations are, in a sense, I think, uh, suggesting actually it's rather complex. And the answer is complex. The question is complex. Um, uh, and, well, uh, we, we can talk about that in due course. Um, and so, observation number one, which is rather banal um, and rather pedantic, um, and it might have something to do with these books, actually. Um, you know, actually in 1609, this would have been very fat. It would have been very handsomely bound. Um, probably in a beautiful in-folio edition um, um, and may not have gone through the... Uh, I'll come back to that. But I like your bibliographical strata, actually. Um, so the banal question is this. Um, what do we mean by law? If we're going to say is law from the Holocene, what exactly, when we say law, what do we mean? And I think there is a sort of tendency to imagine law as being this massive, unitary social instance I don't know who's responsible for that historically. It's probably Jeremy Bentham, but that's just my prejudiced view. It could be Max Weber, I mean, take your pick. Um, but why do we think of law as being this unified system, discourse, set of techniques, field, uh, choose your theoretical term. Um, but if you ask the question, where does law happen? How does law happen? It happens in such a multiplicity of places, in such different ways, and more importantly, in such different mixtures. You know, when you are talking to your accountant about your tax affairs and how to avoid tax, um, that's one kind of mixture. Um, when you are arguing about whether there should be a third runway at Heathrow in front of the High Court or the Court of Appeal, wherever it is now, different kind of mixture. Um, and sort of, you know, so law combines, it recombines, it inflects um, in different ways. Second, um, what exactly is the stuff of law? Is it semantics, concepts, rules? Is it techniques? Um, is it um, media, instruments? Um, and how do those, how are those things held together? I mean, are, is law cultural technique? Is it, how is it, I mean, there's a whole set of questions there. Um, so, is law an imaginary? Is it, is it, is it sort of a way of, of it, thinking about things like responsibility, liability, and so on? And uh, law, lawyers, when they learn the law, tend to learn the law in, in, the, in frames that, that lawyers call facilitating narratives, little parables, you know, which sort of or, or famous cases, which kind of set up the law for you. And I think it's difficult to, to sever the rules from those facilitating narratives. Um, so the Anthropocene, or what I prefer to call the Anthropocene hypothesis, um, is itself a constellation of different perspectives and um, different um, idioms of theory. So and depending on your Anthropocene, as a a uh, couple of very nice articles about this, sort of slightly older one by James Lorimer, where he sort of describes the sort of constellation of different perspectives that make up the Anthropocene. There's a recent French article which describes the Anthropocene as a forum, in a sense, of a different place where different sort of theories and ideas meet. Um, so depending on your Anthropocene, you may, in a sense, break law down in different ways. One vision of the Anthropocene would present law as being a kind of, or maybe not think about law, but think about a sort of infrastructural normativity of a certain kind. The idea that media, spatiality, um, uh, and various other kinds of forces condition or shape the way we live, even before we get to law. I, I think you know, one could use the word nomos, but one has to recall if you're a Schmittian that when Schmidt said nomos, he did not mean law. You know, equation of nomos and law is actually something uh, more problematic. So um, I think what is law is my first observation. I'll, I'll end there. I think it's a massively complex question of, of what it is that is supposed to be from the Holocene. Um, second, um, recently before the 
advent of the Anthropocene, if lawyers were going to periodize law, they would be more inclined to construe law in terms of some socio-historical period, like the Enlightenment or the Industrial Revolution or something like that. More or less specific, doesn't have to be Euro-American. Um, so, you know, sort of, uh, um, the, the point about these periods, the point about these frames is that they are historiographical artifacts. So if you went back in time and you tapped uh, the person you identified as a serf, you know, on the shoulder and said, you know, hey man, uh, you're living in the late feudal era. You know, they kind of turned around and said, well, what, what they would have said, but you know, uh, it would, this would not have made sense to them. So these, these periodizations are inflicted upon the world um, by subsequent historians. The case of the Enlightenment, of course, is interesting because you could say, ah, but you know, people like Kant at the time uh, in their various journals were writing about themselves in terms of the Enlightenment or the Um But the point about the Enlightenment now is that we see it through the lens of theories of publics and media and Foucault's reprise of that Enlightenment essay. So, so these are the, 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 the Enlightenment is not what it was for the people inhabiting and calling themselves Enlightened. And the same is true of the Anthropocene. The Anthropocene is an epistemic artifact. The distinction between the Holocene and the Anthropocene is an epistemic artifact. And one only needs to pay attention to the question of how exactly the Anthropocene, the beginning of the Anthropocene, is supposed to be identified materially, symbolically, etc., etc., to appreciate the work that goes into constructing that artifact and in, and in maintaining it. It hasn't been done yet. You guys can tell me what it's been done. I don't think it's been done yet. Um, so that's the second observation, that the, the, the term Holocene itself is also equally complex. Third, uh, moving on to um, one implication of the question, let, let, let's assume that we've gotten past thinking about that. So if, if law is of the Holocene, um, then an interesting question for me, because I, 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 I'm, well, skeptical about the question, but I, I, if we say law is of the Holocene. Uh, my own work is in um, intellectual property. Um, so as an intellectual property person, I was struck by the fact that in Crutzen's article, which is one of the 50 that you would have read in your long day, um, says that the beginning of the Anthropocene was marked by the invention of the steam engine, or by James Watt's condensing steam engine. So he actually gets the date wrong, but that doesn't matter. Um, and then a slightly later paper uh, says it wasn't the invention of the steam engine, it was the patent of the steam engine. Um, and then you roll forward to a book by Timothy Morton, um, who says that, uh, uh, somewhat hyperbolically, that uh, a patent is bringing about the end of the world. Uh, the steam engine patent um, is the cause of the emission of all of these gases that are bringing the end of the world about. And obviously as an intellectual property lawyer, um, there's a certain kind of um, unwholesome frisson in this idea that a patent is important enough to precipitate the end of the world. So I thought we should pay attention to that and think about you know, what if you take that seriously, hy hyperbole and all, um, how would that work? And actually it does work. It's quite interesting if you think about it because the invention of what steam engine generated a legal case, Bolton and Watt. So Bolton, Matthew Bolton was Watt's uh, business partner and supporter against Bull about whether the patent was valid or not. And it is the single most important foundational case in the history of patent law, is, is that case which decides what, a, what is a patent for. And what you get a patent for is pure ingenuity the invention, not the natural materials, not the forces of nature. You have to, in some sense, abstract from those. And it's that split, that ontological division that patent law makes between pure human ingenuity and the natural resources that somehow are necessary for that, but we can simply transcend. If you want an example, a good example of this is biotechnology. You patent a gene. When you patent a gene, what you get is the gene is supposed to be a pure invention, even though all you're doing is cutting and pasting natural materials. So the patent, James Watt's patent does that work. It symbolically and performatively 
subjugates nature or turns nature into a standing reserve, to use Heidegger's term, a standing reserve um, for the exploit ex exploitation of, of humans. Um, and so, so what steam engine exploits natural forces, natural materials, but then forgets the debt to nature, represses the debt to nature by saying, oh, it's all an idea of what's. And that idea can circulate the globe. And uh, once patent law becomes truly globalized. Um, the second thing that patent law does is that it says you get a patent for whatever is useful. Um, utility in patent law terms is defined purely in technological terms, completely externalizing the harm, any harm that is done by that invention to the rest, to, to, to nature or to the rest of humanity. So in a sense, there are some important constitutional things going on in this patent, um, which have had effects which manifest themselves now in what one might call the Anthropocene. So I think that there's something very interesting um, about the way that law was implicated in the Holocene, is implicated in the Holocene. Um, and just one final word on patents. If anybody has read Kim Stanley Robertson's novel 2312, uh, there's a page in there where it's kind of a, sh a shorthand way of trying to convey the passage of time in the future. There's just a list of inventions. So you get a sense of how the world has progressed through looking at the list of inventions that have been made in this period of um, whatever leading, leading up to this point. And so in a sense, that's the other thing that patents do. They project this symbolism of progress, innovation, in this open-ended way. In a sense, um, they, they, they perfectly sum up the temporality of the Holocene as being the temporality of a society that assumes itself to be immortal. And that assumption of immortality, um, I think, is, is uh, precisely what is problematized now with this, this um, existential crisis of the, uh, of the Anthropocene. So uh, a final point, uh, um, and this is a totally um, uh, somewhat ridiculous point, but it's, uh, this is a serious point at the end of it. I just read your question, and it kind of called to mind um, a sort of uh, kind of pastiche of a Hollywood B-movie. Um, law as the thing from the Holocene. Um, and if you think of the, the law as this kind of uncannily anachronistic entity, you know, something that is actually out of place in the contemporary, the contemporary of the, of, of the Anthropocene, there's a law is like this kind of revenant or the undead that is kind of still persisting quasi-vitally through its own kind of innate sort of, of desire. Um, the, the, the serious side to that um, image of the Hollywood B-movie, the more sober view, is that it is in the nature of law to be always already anachronistic. Um, in a sense, what law does is it generates its own epoch, generates its own epochality. And how does it generate it? It generates it because law has its own innate capacity to personify agentify, um, if that's a verb, it isn't, uh, to schematize time and space, but principally time, in a sense to generate a world, to create a history. Um, and it has, um, it's always done that. Um, in short, what law does is it, 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 it is powered by a set of techni technical competences. And, um, there's a, there's a sort of maybe a very basic reason for that. That is the fact that law is normative. Law, in a sense, it necessarily implies, at least in its own self-description, a certain kind of moment of transcendence in relation to the reality that it inhabits. And that distance, that décalage, that normative décalage, I think um, is inherent to law and maybe one of the, the reasons for this always already being anachronistic. Um, the law has. Um, and I, I, I mean, you started with, with a personal anecdote, and I just because the books, I want to end with one, which um, 
kind of is, is, is a reviewer who kind of put me in my place many, many years ago when I edited a book on Lord Anthropology, which I felt was, you know, okay. Um, and this reviewer said, she said, well, uh, it's all very well, um, maybe about law and anthropology, but this person writes like a lawyer. Um, and I think that going back to this question of what is law and what persists and, and you know, what is the, um, uh, this kind of uncanny undeadness of law, it would be to actually look at the sort of techniques of reading, writing, passing on knowledge that are between, actually this is not a law book, I'm going to disagree with you about that. Um, I think it's a political theory book, in a sense, but um, that, 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 that persists... There are many meanings, that's the policy. <laughs> ..that persists between this and this, uh, the, these two strata. So let me just end there and, um, yeah. Amazing. Thank you. i just pick up from your last point, point on the, the character between the normativity uh, Oh, law. On many levels, the distinction between uh, law and science is uh, on how the world is versus how the law ought to be. And uh, this distinction is uh, somehow a stronghold in the two fields. Uh, law is how the world ought to be how you ought to behave, uh, and suddenly you start listening to scientists and they are uh, all telling us how we should change our lives. Uh, and that is a normative injunction. Uh, we should change our lives. Uh, stop flying around. Uh, why did you take an airplane to come to uh, London? You should come by a raft boat. Uh, it's uh, very interesting that the uh, contemporary uh, conjunction uh, is uh, taking that distinction uh, of normativity and somehow either folding it back to itself or blurring uh, the conditions of uh, the distinction between politics and science. And on many levels, you're uh, indicating, yeah, that's not, po that's not law, it's political theory. So there's a further distinction there between law and, and politics, and which uh, is a really an interesting condition. And you mentioned uh, uh, that the peace <coughs> is the ultimate stability that we ought to, uh, we can discuss whether international law, in particular the law of the sea, has achieved any of uh, that uh, condition or whether it has enabled uh, um, contemporary warfare uh, on a different level. But it seems to me that that distinction between the law as uh, normativity and science as uh, you know, an in inquiry into how things are uh, is, uh, well, we can assume for a second that that is uh, disputed at the moment. So it seems to me that the question then becomes exactly like you're pointing out, Alain, one of semantics, one of geosemantics, and of a particular kind. Uh, where there is no longer a distinction between, uh, say, a sign and a referent, uh, but there is a more complex circularity of that. And because you mentioned in your point one, uh, nomos, uh, of course, uh, the way to read uh, uh, nomos is through uh, starting from scratch uh, and uh, Cornelia Wiesman and uh, the very complex understanding that law does nothing else than have an impulse to archive and uh, constantly write actions. So I, my question uh, starts being about the relationship between writing law and practicing law and trying to detect law. Uh, because it seems to me that uh, the three conditions are very different, and I'm really curious about understanding the three elements. Writing law, writing about law, and just practicing law, with, uh, maybe in a more declaratory condition. What is the practice of law in that sense? How can we distinguish it from any other practice? What is the mode of existence, to use uh, our friend Bruno's uh, jargon, of law, uh, in uh, particular in relationship with the working of scientists in contemporary terms? How do you uh, go about uh, the scientific work, Dao? This book, this was practice of law for very, very pragmatic reason. 
this was but and it was uh, intentional that this book was not to be published in such short form it is part of a manuscript which was 800 pages long so this was a short book really uh, that manuscript was published 250 years later it was not suitable anymore for the pragmatic purpose why this book was published um, it would take a lot more than those 15 minutes but I'll put it in about one to two sentences in on 22nd February 1602 8 o'clock in the morning in the Strait of Singapore three Dutch vessels wanted to leave already because they were waiting and waiting and waiting and no Portuguese carac was arriving and then in the logbook of Admiral uh, Van Schermherk it was written they were blessed at 8 o'clock in the morning a wealthy Portuguese carac appeared and then we were shooting at her from the morning until dawn and well to make a shot to make it shorter what they took from Santa Catarina uh, the carac was comparable to English annual budget in 1602 or 3 and this book was written with the purpose because Grotius was a young advocate at that time mm -hmm. 21 years old when he started to write so the book was written as a legal pamphlet as apology but it became an ideological book it became a, a book of ideology of globalization really over time it was not meant to be it was meant to be not what its title is freedom of disease Marie Liberum. it was meant to be what its subtitle says a subtitle says the right which belongs to Dutch to take part in the East Indian trade so in that sense you could say the book is highly economic book about profit participation in profit but you can also say of course it is illegal yeah. the legal aim of the book was there or in a way to express to legal means the ultimate wish of participating in profit and then when we come to that then I would say no the law is not anachronistic also in its contemporary development in the law of the sea at least if I would speak Prodomo Sua is has been developed since the Second World War by anticipatory approaches not anachronistic for very similar reasons in 1945 Truman declaration Truman proclamation about continental shelf which led to the continental shelf as the legal um, regime At, actually which led ultimately to the development of, of the law of the sea in Antlas in very long uh, development was led by the prospect by anticipation of the development of technology which would be which would enable deeper and deeper uh, reach to the to oil resources in 1967 Arvid Pardo's famous speech in the United Nations General Assembly about common heritage of mankind was about the need for redistribution of minerals because in future they will be missing on land and then we will need to go under the sea so this was very much anticipation it was not an anachronism and then the legal machinery was needed to enable it um, there are other examples 1973 it started about Antarctic minerals the story lasted until 1991 almost 20 years and why did it stop again for this anticipation uh, it stopped because there was an ideological debate in the United Nations about Antarctic minerals about Antarctic treaty uh, treaty system as being an exclusive club uh, and then the Antarctic treaty parties themselves legitimized the role they have as custodians of the Antarctic by adopting the Antarctic environmental protocol the reason why the protocol was adopted was anticipation there was a report an American report at the time um, that in the next 50 years 
there is no likelihood of Antarctic mineral exploration in the end. And this led to law in the Antarctic, the protocol, environmental protocol, which is the crucial element of the system, which indeed was a political uh, instrument, but also legal. So when you look at international law development in the Holocene, it has been led by anticipation. But now there must be a certain difference, I believe. Now, what we have been led by was the anticipation of economic profit. What, and that is the Holocene anticipation. What we probably need to be led by in this Anthropocene, which we say has many meanings, we should return to that. Um, we should be lay, led by, not by maximizing profits, but by minimizing losses. Minimizing losses which are real, uh, which will emerge with, I mentioned the, the example of sea level rise. There will be serious losses for many countries. Not only island, small island countries, also um, um, uh, mainland countries like Bangladesh, like you can name many, many of those. Because um, a good part of that development is inbuilt already in the relationship between the atmosphere, ocean, and ice. So we could mitigate, yes, for some later progression of, 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 this, um, of this phenomenon. But with certain amount of consequences, we certainly will have to deal with. This means we will, have to, we will need to have some anticipation again towards minimizing losses. So in that sense, I don't think that law, or international law at least, is always anachronistic. I think it's anticipatory, but we, we would need to think what is, the, what is leading this anticipation, what should lead this anticipation, what should motivate it. Uh, Ale. So there's a lot on the a lot on the agenda. Um, so maybe I could sort of pick up your initial questions and, and, yeah. and, and, and turn to, to Davos' comments. So I, I, you know, absolutely. I mean, lawyers don't have a monopoly on normativity um, in any sense. I, I was very careful to say it's lawyers' self-description, which sort of generates a kind of epistemic posture. You see what I mean? Of of, uh, of that kind of normativity. But of course, I mean. Um, uh, and that's one of the reasons why in law you see a kind of shift to kind of infrastructure studies because of this idea that there is a kind of functional analog, if you can put it in those terms of law, um, in everything from the design of your iPhone to um, uh, to the um, systems that uh, are in operation that decide whether you are on the no-fly list or not, or, or not, and so on, so on, and so forth. So the law, you know, something like law, is kind of happening, sort of media-enabled or science-enabled in, in, in all sorts of ways. Um, I think the question of what is legal practice, I think, is very, very interesting. Um, it does connect up to the question of anachronism, I think. Um, and at the moment, uh, as many people will know, lawyers are very anxious about the rise of, of AI. Uh, and uh, the projection would be that a lot of those jobs in city law firms uh, are not going to survive for the next five, ten years. Um, and the rubric under which um, lawyers are in the UK are talking about um, uh, the, the, the influence of AI is under, under the label legal operations. Um, legal operations um, are tasks, uh, law tasks that could be performed obviously by software. And it turns out a lot of law could be done by software. Um, coincidentally, Legal Operations is also the title of a book by um, one of the theorists I have in mind in talking about anachronism, Jan Thumeur, uh, whose work is collected under the, in French under this title, uh, Les Opérations du Droit. Um, and I'm not sure the title was chosen by him, because obviously it's a posthumous edition, I don't believe it was. But the idea of these operations is that these operations are technical maneuvers um, that law, in a sense, is not driven by society or by um, uh, um, even if there are inputs. Um, but in a sense, everything has to be translated into, passed through this kind of technical uh, machinery. I think that sort of gets at what I mean by anachronism. Right? I absolutely take your point that, of course, law is of the world, is, is being presented with questions for resolution, for anticipation, and so on and so forth. That's, that's necessarily the case. But the anachronism is kind of 
like anachronism in a kind of art historical sense, in a sense what you have to think about is the conjunction of these two things, the being of the moment whilst not being of it. Um, and the not being of it um, is precisely to do with the technical core of those legal operations. Those legal operations have a genealogy, a history, an archaeology um, that in a sense detaches that it's, is, 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 I'm not going to go so far as to say autonomous, but uh, um, is not of the world, is, is, is also millennial in a sense in its, um, in, its, uh, uh, in its duration. So I think that what you call legal machinery, you said, of course it has to go through the legal machinery. It's that legal machinery, I think, that is the moment that is of anachronism. So again, thinking of anachronism of being of the present without being of the present, or in the present without being of the present. I'm not quite sure what the, uh, what the phrasing would be. I think my way of dressing is a sort of anachronism. <laughs> <laughs> Lawyer with a tie. I'm really interested in uh, this notion of anticipation, because in uh, architecture, anticipation is often misunderstood. You know, when you plan in architecture, it's nothing to do really with the future. Uh, it's how your plan uh, enables uh, conditions of the here and now to be realigned, to be uh, uh, sometimes disassociated with uh, previous conditions. Uh, so uh, architecture is in many ways uh, thinking of uh, planning and the future, not as a fix in, in, uh, in time and place uh, conditions to be attained, but uh, mobilizing uh, conditions. And so it seems to me that the way through which you are describing anticipation is far more similar to what uh, media theory we call uh, feed forward. Not feedback, but feed forward. That means that you are uh, already uh, somehow modifying your practice in anticipation, let's say, of a possible uh, reception that is yet to come, but doesn't necessarily have to ever be uh, achieved. So it's a con condition of you know, modifying uh, the present, and I think that uh, is how I understand it from my perspective in architecture. Um, the title of the series, Plan the Planet, is all about this inversion of uh, planning and how we mobilize a sort of what we call an infrastructural unconscious uh, of planning, and uh, we always have to revert to normativity uh, within uh, planning. So the question is really uh, whether uh, in your practice, in your uh, operations, uh, your in particular, when you meet uh, um, other uh, members of the working group, uh, the geologists, you see other ways of projecting uh, time. And uh, I'm really interested in understanding from how you come to their projection of time, their anticipation from your point of view. And uh, then I would like to follow up on this uh, with Alan. What is your uh, understanding of their way of keeping time, so to say, of uh, measuring and recording time? Uh, their measuring of time, if you speak about majority of members of any working group in stratigraphy, and also in the Anthropocene working group, is a stratigraphic working group. Their understanding of time should not be anticipation, it should be reminiscence of past, in a way. So the, the, the difference of the Anthropocene working group is that this past has come to the present day. All the previous working groups were dealing exclusively with the past. The Holocene working group dealt with uh, 11,700 years before present, counted from year 2000 plus minus 99 years. This still for us looks as a deep past, indeed, for in any any legal understanding or sociological and so on, historical. But um, so the Anthropocene Working Group, as an anticipation, um, you might say these are contradictory terms. The Anthropocene Working Group is looking at what has happened, not what will happen. It is very tempting politically to look at what will happen. But this is not the mandate. 
of the Anthropocene Working Group. The mandate is very clear. And from that mandate, also what is the Anthropocene can be derived. Um, now there are many understandings of the Anthropocene, but the mandate of the Anthropocene Working Group is, is really clear on that. And it says, and there, there can't be much doubt about it, what the hypothesis is. It says that this is, that the group needs to investigate uh, the need and production value in establishing the term Anthropocene, but for, and this is the, what the hypothesis is, the period during which human modification of natural systems has become predominant. So they don't need to anticipate in that way. They need to establish what has happened and when it has happened. When has the human impact on the modification of natural systems become predominant? You, you mentioned the article by Crutzen and steam machine and industrial revolution and so on, but that was his, his own initial view. But the group, um, and Crutzen included, uh, has um, accepted and voted, held a wide, binding vote on the mid 20th century as the time when the human modification of natural systems has become predominant. So of course that my own view on anticipation is very different. As a lawyer, I really am less interested in this aspect. I am interested in what it is for. What it is for for development of legal scholarship. Um, so in that way, yes, it is anticipation. And I've mentioned several times the example of sea level rise. And this is what we are working on in terms of anticipation. How can we anticipate the change of international law given one manifestation of this natural change, which is sea level rise? How do we plan for this? And what do we do? What do we propose? And also, how do we make periodization of those proposals. Because we can't have one single proposal. We will have short term and then mid to longer term proposals. Short term proposals for different international law based on this anticipation have been formulated here. I'm very happy to give you this as organizer and as a token of appreciation for invitation. This has been recently published. So now the work, the, 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 this international committee on sea level rise and international law is working on mid to longer term uh, proposals uh, related to the question of statehood, to international law personality, to human rights and migrations. Here, uh, anticipation is very what you would expect from lawyers. Freeze everything. So freeze legal situation, regardless of the changes of the coastal zones or the coast baselines. Um, the entitlements are considered, the legal entitlements are considered those when the zones were already proclaimed and established in accordance with the law of the sea convention. So this is as much as today's imagination of lawyers go in, in terms of near, near future anticipation. I was uh, fortunate enough to be able to attend one of your preliminary uh, meetings at uh, the International Law uh, Association in Lockwood when you were debating this. I would like to come back to one of the aspects there. But, um, Alain, you mentioned in uh, the beginning of your point, I think it was point number, what was it? Intellectual property number three mm -hmm. uh, on the patent. There's a particular aspect of uh, what you said which is really remarkable, and, and how what is patented is ingenuity, but in, of a particular kind. In partic uh, it's a function. You know, it's uh, almost a mathematical function, you know, and uh, mathematical functions do nothing else than transform things. It's a transformative uh, element that needs to be uh, addressed. I'm interested in understanding, from your point of view, the condition of, as an external uh, viewer, um, 
it's quite obvious, and you mentioned this also in one of your uh, writings. Uh, the work of the Anthropocene Working Group at the moment, in particular with uh, the introduction or the intrusion of the world of the technosphere, the technofossils, mm. is somehow looking at the function of the technosphere on the Earth system, and uh, somehow in a similar way as the invention of uh, James Watt, trying to understand the impact of human activity of the through the technosphere on the Earth system. But there's a mediation there of the technosphere, of the function. So you're start, uh, it seems to me that the Anthropocene Working Group, through, your, uh, through the, reading your work, is somehow endeavoring in the study of a function, of a transformative action, of a completely different kind. In particular, the relationship between a fossil and fossilization in relationship to the function is uh, you know, very uh, difficult to grasp. Uh, it's, uh, many, it's not really fossilized yet, it's just a trace fossil. It's not, it's not undergoing processes of uh, compacting and uh, chemical and transformation, it's just leaving uh, traces and recording traces. So the question uh, I'm getting to is, can you tell us more about how you read the function Function in uh, the Anthropocene, and how is it different in your mind, if at all, from functions that have characterized in intellectual property in, from its outset uh, in James Watt's time? That's, uh, that's fantastic. I, uh, can I, I mean, but before, before we turn to that, can I just go back to your planning? Uh, question and I, all I want to say is going back to the first point I made about what do we mean by law I think depending on what version of law you are inhabiting I think the approach to planning and time is of course different if you're in adjudication and certainly for common lawyers um, the the presentation of the decision is always as though the past was simply the future was simply repeating the past the logic of authority in adjudication, picking the common law, is to say, well, it happened before, this is like what happened before, you know. So the future just gets folded back into the past through a kind of trick, obviously, because obviously that's the, that's the sort of law, it's like a time machine in that, in, in, in that sense. If you're talking about law as regulation, for example, or the closer law gets to regulation, um, then you get away from that logic of temporality and you get much closer to a kind of Foucauldian version of what you were talking about in terms of the, the feed forward and the, um, and the sort of reflexivity, that sort of... Uh, so I think, it, I think just very quickly, I think it really... The, the, there could be a whole um, very interesting analysis of different kinds of modes of, 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 uh, of, um, of, of time making. <laughs> of chronopoiesis, whatever you want to call it, um, in, in law, which would be, which would be, would be incredible. I, I don't know what to do with your last question because it's so fantastic and it's uh, just because, um, absolutely. So with the point about the patent is that what you get is a patent relates to the ingenious inflection of nature. It's as almost as though you can precipitate out the inflecting curve, which of course is nothing, <laughs> and say, what, what you get the patent for is not all the stuff it goes through and the trump, you know, it's just the, it's just the, the, the curve of transformation. So the word transformation is key in, in, in the discourse um, to describe that. So what you're saying is there's a similar kind of inflection being mapped, not mapped. Um, uh, what's Recorded. The, yes, in the, in, in the form of this, fossil, pro, this thing undergoing fossilization. Um, and that makes me think of this kind of very old connection between um, a certain kind of legal forensics and um, history and geology, that point where geology splits from history, where, where in the 17th century, 15th, 16th, 17th century, people are finding these things called monuments or, or medallions or medals, which are basically saying, look, a fossil is exactly like a coin, an ancient coin that you find in the ground. The ancient coin is, in a sort of um, Carlo Ginzburg sense, fantastic evidence, because the coin doesn't lie. The coin has the impress of the king's 
add and dates and some information, and that sort of numismatic information is is ultimately corroborating, you know, more or less fantastical stories about this king or whatever. The same thing with a fossil. A fossil is a similar kind of. Um, I think it's it, Hutton calls them uh, written with God's hand. So you have this idea of the, uh, of the fossil doing. So in a sense, you have this kind of wonderful connection between a certain sense of the uh, quasi-textual forensics, if you see what I mean, of the, of the recording um, that goes back to that to that early period. Um, but I need to sorry, I need to think more about that. I think it's just very. Uh, it's uh, a discussion about time and uh, anachronism, and we are running quite late. Uh, but uh, before we open up, I have uh, one last question for uh, both of you. And it has to do with the simplicity of uh, our questions. We always ask very simple questions. We know that the answers are so difficult. And one of the questions that we like to ask, and our students know very well, is how heavy cities are. And uh, they. Uh, they cannot stand it, I think. Uh, the, uh, the question is about horizons. And it's interesting that, uh, in my understanding, you both uttered uh, the word horizon at different points. Uh, it seemed to me, but maybe I'm wrong, that you were describing horizons as time-based as you know, what might happen next, or something that to look out on. Well, as someone who's far more uh, prosaic and secular, I always thought that an horizon is nothing else than an interception of gaze with the surface of the planet. Uh, it's just over there. Uh, it's not in the future. I know that maybe things come from over the horizon to you, or you might disappear uh, if you run away too far. But the question is really, how do you imagine the making of uh, law when the horizon is no longer giving you uh, a capacity of describing the polity you're in as being similar to you, when the horizon is not just who you keep away from uh, and some compact you know, but somehow uh, muddles things. And uh, so how will it actually operate when you have to imagine a planetary condition uh, where you are no longer uh, look compacting a polity versus a fixed horizon? You mentioned that you know, the baseline is going to be unstable. Mm -hmm. And in this book, you show that you have to keep it in spite of sea level rise. So you will have to mark, in my understanding, some rocks uh, at the current uh, low tide, even though the low tide will be much higher. How do you imagine that? How, do, how will it all work? Horizon here has several interconnecting meanings. Now, with baselines and with Holocene, we talk about frontiers. But with this change, which Conditionally, we, we could term Anthropocene. The horizon is, it is time, future time. That is one meaning of it. But essentially, it is the horizon of consequences. And consequences which, in terms of what we are doing in, uh, uh, regarding climate change and sea level rise, which are conditioned by ways and proposals for legal mechanisms how to avoid conflicts, how to prevent conflicts. So the reason for near-term horizon to be freezing of the current situation is precisely that. This is the, an attempt to minimize the likelihood of conflicts about the changing zones. But we also know that this freezing will not last that long. How long, we don't know, because there is a conditionality not of time, but of consequence. At one point, those frozen zones will generate more conflict than, um, than prevent them or help in avoiding them. And that is also the horizon. So horizon here, ultimately, is related 
to means of conflict prevention. So to understand correctly, you are freezing the baseline because the frozen ices are melting. Um, no, the, there is no freezing of baselines. No? There is freezing of, it was a discussion which you have seen mm. was still about baselines. Uh, it is the freezing of maritime entitlements. Entitlements are frozen, this means, but uh, the ice have melted. Yes, it is, it is a consequence of ice, of ice change, of course, and, and the impact of those changes on, on the, on the yeah, coastal zones. So it's interesting that there's a transfer of semantics you now about uh, freezing. Freezing, yes. Mm -hmm. So we are freezing when everything is melting, but it won't last long. Okay. And this is why we have the other contrarism, because when conflicts become too hot, then we will have to unfreeze. But we don't know to do that. That is our problem. We don't know yet to do what so, to do. You, Alain, you mentioned that law is a semantic construct. Now I start understanding. Um. <laughs> so I think just in terms of the horizon, I'm not quite sure how I used it, but I think just to give you a very small illustration which goes to the question of sea and the gaze meeting the uh, surface. So there was a case in Australia almost 20 years ago, uh, where the indigenous people uh, were claiming land rights in an island. And so the question was, they were claiming these land rights, did they also get a certain amount of the sea, the seabed around this, this island? Um, and so because this was a time when the Australian courts were pretending at least to you know, take seriously what the indigenous people were saying, uh, so the judges go down to the seashore with the elders of the, of the group and they say, so, so what are you guys claiming? You know, how far? You know, can you tell us? And the chief says, well, as far as the eye can see. What is that? Oh, what is as far as the eye can see? How many, how many miles is that? How many? And so this, this sort of transcript goes on with this absolute mutual incomprehension of what as far as the eye could see could possibly mean. Um, so I think for me, Horizon is that. It's, it's um, in the case of Euro-American law, um, it is a phenomenological horizon. It's, it's a schemat schematism or a schematization of time or space. Um, and in the case of prognostication around um, climate and sea level, we know that, I mean, anyone who's read the work of Paul Edwards knows just how much infrastructural complexity there is behind any particular horizon uh, that is in play. Um, Fantastic. Friends, come and uh, ask questions. Elena. Hi, um, I've had to write this down because I'm very conscious I'm speaking or asking a question to two, two lawyers on that side of the table. So um, I want to pick up on the shift from maximizing profit to minimizing losses and perhaps frame it as a shift from anticipation to precaution in a way channeling the, this protocol we call the precautionary principle. The question then is what and how is this enshrined within a Westphalian in, enshrined within a Westphalian notion of sovereign dominion and domination that still delimits and indeed patents us? What would customary law bring to reforming IR and indeed IPR? In this other is this another way, another habit of mind from the Holocene in fact as well, um, that shows alternative ways of projecting time and property. I think that um, the little reading I've done around this, this issue is um, that the Arctic Inuit Circumpolar Council and how it is thinking with the sea might indeed show a way forward. And it, I would, you know, it would uh, be really interesting to hear your views on customary law because we've spoken about all the other kinds of law which relate to property in very Westphalian modes of thinking, but we haven't mentioned the customary at all. I would certainly agree that the shift, as you described it, from anticipation to precaution it is well put, and I would very much agree with that. In terms of sources of international law, what we will have to look at, well, there are, there are several alternatives, treaty law, of course, 
uh, we haven't spoken that much about treaty law, but because the Convention on the Law of the Sea is written as a treaty law, but in reality, it is customary law. It is codification of customary law, presented in a form of a treaty. Um, a good part of what was written in the Convention in 70s and early 80s was customary law, and some of this was not, but it became customary law over time, like exclusive economic zone, for example. It was not customary law at that time, it became. So, but whether customary law will be sufficient, that is a big question, because we have a third category of sources of international law beyond treaty and custom, and it, these are general principles of law. I believe that when we look at the, cha the challenges which are upcoming in the Anthropocene, or in the Anthropocene conditions, if you wish, whether, whether, it will be, whether there will be a formalization of the Anthropocene or not, we don't know. But we do know that changing, rapidly changing conditions in, in certain spheres will happen. Um, so the question is, in terms of legal sources, whether we will have to look at very general principles of law. Um, whether we, as Alan mentioned, um, anachronism, I, I very much agree on that lawyers look very much and what has happened in terms of methodology. And then you look, for instance, for statehood or if there is a loss of territory. What would be the instinct of international lawyer is to look for precedents and analogies. And then in that sense, the first analogy would be, oh yes, there were certain examples like um, Maltese order or government in exile. But then here, we are talking about island states where families live not the Maltese order, which is a very nice villa in Aventino Hill, but about real needs. What are the general principles of law which could be used for safeguarding their rights for identity, keeping the, the nationhood and so on? So uh, customary law perhaps will have to be developed for that purpose. It probably will lead to some treaty law, and if not, then it will lead to conflict. Um, more than that, I don't, I don't know whether I can say really, but I think that beyond customary law, general principles of law, the broader category, will probably have to have play a role as well in this development. So. I can only offer a sort of historical aside, which is to say that the precautionary principle is definitely of the Holocene, uh, because genealogically or archaeologically, it can be retraced to the French notion, 16th, 17th century notion of la police, in the sense of uh, uh, the mode of, of, con of conserving a population's security and health um, and safety. So there's a, there's a Definitely a, a Holocene line there. Perhaps, but because we were not precautious, we are in the Anthropocene. <laughs> no one would want to be still inhabiting 16th, 17th century Paris, I think. But yeah. Um, just, I want to riff a bit on this point and bring back maybe a bit of the chrono paresis aspect. Um, I think it's, I'm not sure where to reference, but it's work that, um, from, from you, Alan, around the relationship between history and geology um, and the kind of question of, of timing. So on, on one aspect, this kind of marking it epoch um, also thinks about, or let's say also um, constructs a form of synchronicity, of synchronicity between places and times, right? And so in a sense, it seems to, um, as opposed to like history making or questions around kind of a series of events in places and times, it places a kind of homogenous point in which then things before and after 
regardless of context or regardless of other facts are marked. And I think this question around um, what seems also kind of the elephant in the room around a kind of the colonial construct around, you know, um, it's a shame that, for example, we didn't talk about, in terms of ocean law, the question of the Western Indian Ocean or the ways in which, you know, from the 8th century and the birth of Islam, for example, that what is considered a cradle of globalization, right, operated in terms of nation well, trade between different cities across the littoral that are kind of extremely expansive and a very kind of developed form of written law, right, through certain Sufi jurists, etc., that operated, and that operate, I mean, actually, in, in certain aspects to the present day. But my question um, directed actually more around the intellectual property point or the pattern, um, which seems really kind of curious as a form of, um, as a kind of mark um, around you know, the kind of question of the mode of operation, which is the thing being patented, right, the invention and this kind of infliction, um, as something that, um, you know, what the, the patenting of genes begins to disrupt is this notion, or like a notion around not being able to patent what is natural, right? And I wonder if there is, if you can just, um, Think, and it's more of an observation, but something that I would like, like to hear more around is insofar as what is natural within this whatever Anthropocene hypothesis is also shifting, right? And so in a sense, there's the rupture in terms of what is natural, what might have deemed to be natural as being patented, but then at the same time, that frame is also expanding as a kind of double move. And I wonder if there's something within that, that within this kind of question of um, intellectual property of what can be um, controlled or what begins to define, let's say, those terms in, in reverse um, operate. So, so. Thank you for absolutely fantastic. Can uh, come over here so that we can uh, listen more clearly to what uh, Alain has to say? Absolutely fantastic. Uh, Questions and I, I just sort of this, there are too many questions in your question. So just to pick up on a, on a couple of points. I mean, I think that um, alongside the patent, I think one of the legal forms. It's not just a legal form. It goes actually does go back to this to this book. It's not just a legal form um, in terms of the the story of how law is implicated in the uh, in the Holocene and also in the. Um, bringing us to the point of the Anthropocene, um, one of those legal forms is what uh, John Harris in a beautiful article calls the long distance corporation. Um, exactly like the you know, Dutch East Indies Company or the, um, uh, the, the British version or the French version. Um, and that legal form of the long distance corporation with the way it distributes risks and enables these joint ventures and, and has the lobbying power, et cetera, to come up with this, et cetera, et cetera, um, is precisely one of the things that is, is an agent in, the, um, in, in that colonial expansion, that particular representation of peoples and nature. So I think that's absolutely a, um, In terms of the pattern, just very briefly, you are absolutely spot on that what's happening now, and it's happening right now in the US, US, not surprisingly, um, is a sort of attempt to completely ditch this distinction between ingenuity and nature. So, well, we don't know what that is any longer, so let's just um, uh, argue that what we want is utility plus not, not excessive monopoly. We even forget this attachment to nature any longer. I think that's a very interesting move, precisely if one situates it in the way that you situate it. So. There were, of course, uh, the right of the Dutch to uh, participate uh, in, the, say, in the commerce in the Indies is a right to colonize. Mm -hmm. the, I think that the, the question uh, that you're posing uh, opens up a slightly different line of thinking rather than the relationship to nature uh, in colonization. It's one of uh, assuming which lineage of history has to carry further authority on other lineages. It's not clear uh, whether in uh, your question about uh, the uh, Indian Ocean and the practices uh, of you know, commerce and the long established polities that raise from, say, the Gulf all the way to um, both sides of the 
Western Indian Ocean. There is uh, a formalization of nature uh, that is against the formalization of nature that we are seeing, but what we are definitely seeing is that one argument has to be stronger than the other. Uh, so the, I, it seems to me that we are uh, overlapping uh, different uh, operations of law, uh, different normativities, while we're not yet eliciting what that nature uh, might be. And so maybe uh, we have to uh, hold for a second the colonial moment or the post-colonial moment in order to unravel the question uh, that we started with about uh, nature and then it was followed up with what is law. And so it seems uh, a very interesting uh, way maybe that we need to uh, start making distinctions uh, for at least pro tempore in order to, uh, for, but I really would like you to come and join us. It's not just a formality and uh, <laughs> a, a, uh, it's uh, you know, how we uh, would like you to all come and enjoy uh, some of the uh, benefits of having uh, food uh, a round table is that you can enjoy some food uh, and drinks. Um, please come uh, here and let's continue the discussion for at least for a while in a formal term uh, and record it and then I hope uh, also Informally. Do we have further questions? There was, I saw, uh, they. Um, I, I guess I'm interested in the, this distinction which is coming out around common law and code law. And whether, this is very loud, um, the law that anticipates is one that aspires to be code, ultimately. And whether there's really actually a threat there's any other kind of law which goes extinct other than the one that is other than the one that aspires to be the code that anticipates and um, I don't mean that in a kind of like politically motivated way but whether sort of code is this pharmacon in this complex as something which does anticipate if that makes sense think about this anticipation, as I said, uh, it was always for economic gains. Anticipation in, in Truman's declaration was about oil, anticipation in part of speech was about minerals, about redistribution also. Uh, so if I have caught your question right, uh, I'm not quite sure whether... Yeah, well, I, I guess to put it simply, is the law that anticipates one that aspires to be code. And in that sort of moment, that aspiration to be code, is there a conflation of the practice of law, of the reading of law and the writing of law? And is it not really the case that we're actually trying to preserve other kinds of law alongside that? Because I am like, interested in the fact, for instance, that like the word justice never came about in this entire conversation. And that if we're thinking about the instruments of law, surely it is to the service of justice. Yes, definitely. Justice was referred to in both cases. In justice was to secure the rights for the most developed nations to get the hold of continental shelf resources. And reference to justice was definitely made. What sort of justice? And that's, that's a different case, question. The justice was much more prominent in the call for common heritage of mankind as a deep seabed resources. But again, the anticipation was there for reasons of economic redistribution. Now, justice, when we would now look forward, justice for countries which won't be having their territory, like Tuvalu, incidentally the smallest country, ordinary country we have in terms of population, uh, like Marshall Islands, which are slightly bigger, like um, Kiribati. Justice there comes from a very different angle. Justice to continue, not as individuals, but as people, that is a very different sort 
of anticipation of justice in compared to the redistribution of economic wealth. This is not only economy we are speaking about, this is not only politics, this is, these are very basic human rights involved. And it, it brings us to the question of what are the inherent rights? There are def different understandings of what is an inherent right in international law. One understanding is in the law of the sea. And they never came in conflict so far. But we can foresee that they might come in, in conflict. One understanding of inherent right in the law of the sea was defined by the International Court of Justice in a very famous case in 1969, North Sea Continental Shelf case, delimitation of the continental shelf in between Denmark, um, the Netherlands, and Germany. And there it was said and became customary law, we were talking about customary law, that there is an inherent right of a coastal state to continental shelf. And this means a sovereign right to exploit its resources. And this translates to exploitation of oil, which is done by, of course, oil companies. So this is one inherent right. But then there is another inherent right, the right to life under international law of, of an individual is an inherent right. And that is a part of treaty and customary law again. And then there is a third understanding, which comes to this justice case of islands countries, uh, the right of state to self-defense, and self-defense can be interpreted in various ways, is an inherent right. The right of continuation of statehood, if you wish. Those understandings of inherent rights, especially the first inherent right of a coastal state to mine for oil, an inherent right of an individual and a state even of existence can come in conflict in perhaps not that far a distant future. And that could be again due to consequences of sea level rise. As one example. So the question of justice could be to a certain extent translated to the question of what is really an inherent right? And can we really think that the state has inherent right to continental shelf in those circumstances? Or inherent right to mine for oil? Is this an inherent right? If it hampers inherent right of an individual to life or inherent right of a state of remaining a state. So we could anticipate this type of conflict. Can I just say very, very briefly, I think picking up on the anthropocene, I think what yeah, I think what you, what you have both put on the table for us uh, wonderfully is, is, is really what should be a question for the Anthropocene. It's a question of legal imagination in some sense, and that is um, what idioms of justice um, should be in play here, given um, how one reckons with these unprecedented sort of in imbrications of time, space, um, history um, that, that are presented under the rubric of the Anthropocene. So I think the question of not even, not only who's justice, but, but what idioms of justice. Um, and that connects kind of with your question about code, because I, uh, from one perspective, a code is always a work in progress. It's always being fabricated, um, even if one imagines it in a Napoleonic sense as something that is um, finished once and for all. And that process of fabrication um, is one that inherently risks alienating um, justice, or the, the, the justice that is supposed to be the objective of that process. Could I throw in a little bit a further difficulty in thinking codes in contemporary architecture? Codes are not an aspiration to a stable condition, but uh, on the contrary, are conceptualized as precursors to, art, to design. <laughs> 
we, and that's maybe to add to the anxiety about artificial intelligence. Uh, <laughs> Irit. I wanted to ask about the, the role of, of transformation, because the, the way in which you were mapping out what, what I heard <coughs> sorry, of this discussion, the law has the ability to cope with change so that it can, um, diff, diff, changing circumstances can then be met by um, various kind of, of, of legal um, shifts. But what we're experiencing now around climate change, around questions of environment in the Anthropocene, is actually imbued with a huge transformative shift. So the, the ways in which large scale, large segments of the population are encountering knowledge, encountering a kind of dramatic sense of crisis, um, becoming familiar with language, gaining a little bit of access to scientific and other kinds of knowledges around these, these kind of crises. That's transformation and not change. And so my question is, to this particular moment, which is very distinct from any other moment around, let's say, questions of the planet, when suddenly populations have access to planetary knowledge, which they didn't even two years ago, that's a transformation. And how does the law encounter transformation? It certainly is, as you say, a huge transformative shift. Mm -hmm. I fully could agree with, can agree with that. How will the law deal with it? Not easy, of course. We have spent six years of intensive discussion in this international committee, which is under the International Association, there's a seat here in London, International Committee on International and Civil Rights, only to define that for the near term future, we would wish to freeze the current legal situation in face of really huge transform transformation. Um, so the questions are very, very complex. And my own belief in ability of law to be timely is in a way, I would not say pessimistic, I would perhaps not, waste, not say skeptical, but cautious. Cautious of, will we be really able to propose in advance, because we need to do that, a certain transformation for the Anthropocene. Um, and I can't respond to what the practice of law will do, because I'm not dealing with practice. What I can respond to is that it is the utmost responsibility of international law scholarship to focus its energy on this type of endeavor. In the law of the sea, which is my field, in the law of statehood, in the law of human rights, that this type of challenge which we are um, facing as really huge transformative shift, which is very quick, deserves or dictates responsibility of international law scholarship of adopting different conceptual perspectives, um, different methodological approaches in, in terms of treaty interpretation, for instance, and with awareness of the ultimate goal, which really is uh, what every miss or the Miss Universe would say on the context, saving the world peace, but really preventing conflicts and avoiding conflicts. 
um, that is the constant of international. There is no transformation in that. And I don't think every, anyone wishes to advocate transformation in that sense. But transformation in terms of scholarly paradigm shift is very important. Why, why is this important for international law as, as practice? I said I'm not dealing with practice. However, for the practice of international law, international law has a scholarship of international law has somewhat different standing than in other disciplines. International law scholarship is included in Article 38 of the Statute of International Court, which lists the sources of international law, as, together with international judiciary, as a means of interpreting the content of the sources of international law. This means interpretation. However, the role of scholarship should be stronger towards contributing to the development of international law. This is my, my conviction. So, in that sense, I am, I am not skeptical, but in the sense of how much this will really be uh, translated into practice of international law, that I don't know. But we have to do what, what we can do, and this is our responsibility as scholars. So when you also ask me about my practice, I don't have any practice, John. <laughs> I'm a scholar. Research professor, as they say. I don't even teach. Carlos. Yeah. I, I'd like to ask a question, actually. I think you very kindly showed us uh, your diagram you know, built up and uh, relates it to possibly the world that we have here in this institution. And I think it's very important. And I think one of the interesting things about it in comparison to the, the, the other presentation, one moment here, this discussion of the patent for the steam engine being the, the moment in which you know, everything changed. Uh, and you very eloquently put forward that uh, basically the conclusion is the change is in uh, the middle of the 20th century, is when I was born a long time ago. Um, so one of the interesting things about that is actually that this diagram, uh, in a sense, formalizes, so it delineates what international law was trying to do, and you give it an economic bias so that that's what it was, and we need to change that. So is, 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 does that mean that, in a sense, this diagram is actually implicit in the problems that have happened in terms of climate change and so on? Because, in a sense, it facilitated the possibility of the exploitation of minerals and so on in a manner that actually avoided conflict. Uh, and therefore, now, this different type of conflict that we're trying to look at. But one of the interesting things about it is that that is so precise that in a sense it allowed that to happen, that economic model to happen in a way. So therefore, I mean, I'm not, I'm, I'm not allocating blame, so please don't get me wrong. All I'm trying to say is it's quite interesting whether the international law had something to do with it. So I think it'd be quite hard to take patent law and say, ah, oh, right, it's, it was the fault of patent office, as it were, you know, in a sense. Whereas I think the territorial one becomes really very, very interesting indeed. And in a sense, if one element of it is fixed, uh, in a way, I think the whole thing has to move, in a sense, because all the relationships of all the other lines that you're putting down on there are all to do with the exploitation of nature or the planet or the animals or the fishing. Yes, it is so, of course. So the question really is, for, for some future of, of law of the sea, is how to organize activities which stretch through those zones. We don't have that at the moment. The rights are very clearly cut here. Sovereignty, sovereign rights, exclusive jurisdiction, and then free for all. Now, whether one could think of regulating certain activities through those zones in a uniform way, that's a question. And, and there might be a need in the time to come, but uh, the architecture itself indeed has facilitated the developments. But they were facilitators even before this architecture, and yep. here we have one. So that 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 even without the architecture which we have has given the ideological framework, if you wish, for the globalization which which occurred even though it was not meant to do that. Maybe just to put 
that in context of uh, oceanographic studies, uh, it's quite obvious that uh, the recent uh, developments show how deep ocean activity is fundamental in uh, what is called the upwell uh, of nutrients onto land. So we are in the gray part to the left, we're highly dependent on the, gr from, on the activity happening on the gray part on the right of the diagram. So questions of you know, responsibilities of internal waters uh, versus that is quite in impressively uh, shuffled up by research uh, by scientists like Tim Lenton that was uh, recently here. Known. So the title here was Freedom of the Sea, the main title. But with understanding of the consequences which we have today, we, we have to speak not about the freedom of the sea, but about the responsibility for the sea. And then the view of those zones in terms of this responsibility would need to change of how to regulate activities across. But the question of de re deconstructing, reconstructing those zones is a very difficult, very serious, mm -hmm. very far reaching, and we have not come there in terms of proposals, not really. It was supposed to be 15 minutes uh, short uh, statement and a long discussion, but uh, everyone is still uh, attentive and it's uh, about time that we close. So maybe we have one last question. Uh, is there anybody? So that's it. Could I, could I ask one question? Yes. Why nobody opens those wines? Because if we were in Norway, they would already be served. <laughs> that was my... Uh, question as well. Please uh, join me uh, in thanking uh, really deeply uh, Gavin and